Good morning. Uh, we're just uh, waiting for people to come in and uh, we'll start in a few seconds. I can see the number going up. So let's wait a few more seconds before starting. Wait until the clock marks one, eleven o one. Okay, so let's let's give it a go. Um, good morning and uh, welcome. My name is Luca Corradi. I'm a director here at the OGTC, and I'm your host for today. And I'm delighted today to have uh, here Gunther Newcombe, uh, our, our speaker, and also our panelists, uh, Roy Stenhouse from OGTC and Lucy Green uh, from Apollo, Apollo Energy Transition Manager. So welcome to Insight 60. Uh, some of you might have been here before for the new people uh, here, how it works. It is our series of uh, interactive webinars uh, on the topic of energy transition. And it works like a 30 minutes uh, presentation by our speaker and then uh, a Q&A session uh, with the panel uh, and also with the audience. So in terms of uh, housekeeping, uh, you're now muted and your camera is off, but I'm encouraging you to uh, submit your questions uh, in the Q&A function during the presentation so that we can collect them uh, and uh, use them uh, at the end uh, with the panel. And uh, I will come uh, and uh, unmute, we will unmute you and so you can ask uh, your question uh, personally or uh, I can read them uh, if you prefer so. So Gunther, uh, welcome uh, today and welcome Lucy and Roy. Good to have you here today. Morning. 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 So before I introduce you, Gunther, uh, just a couple of words about uh, Project Orion, which is the topic of today, you know, and it's very important uh, for us at OGTC because uh, as we progress uh, towards uh, a net zero economy, the North Sea is transitioning from a purely oil and gas uh, play into a more diversified uh, energy basin. And that means an increasing role for renewables, uh, for hydrogen, for carbon capture and sequestration. And this diversification also provides an opportunity, an opportunity for integration of these different energy sources, but also an opportunity to share uh, infrastructures among them. And also for our supply chain and the workers in the sector to transfer their skills uh, into this uh, integrated energy vision. And integrated energy vision is actually a report that we published on GDC uh, last, uh, last November, uh, which you can find on our website. So, Project Orion is an example of this integration. It is an energy hub combining different technologies. And it is a concept that might well represent the future, the near future of the North Sea operations. And so we're party, we are happy as OGTC to be part of it and to help solving the technology challenges. And I'm delighted to have Gunther today here to tell us all about this project. So Gunther, uh, before uh, we get into the heart of the conversation, can you just give us uh, maybe a one minute uh, introduction to yourself? Who are you uh, and what you do? Yeah, thanks Luca. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, the webinar today. Really appreciate your time and, and interest in Orion. Um, my, my background is uh, primarily oil and gas, uh, over 40 years uh, in the oil and gas sector. Uh, most of that with BP and also five years with the Oil and Gas Authority as their operations director until uh, um, end of 1Q last year when um, I stepped down from the OGA and started working on the Orion Energy Hub. And uh, I suppose changed my spots into stripes and went looking at renewables for the first time seriously. So um, yeah, it's a, a great project and uh, Really good to have this opportunity to get across to you uh, what the project is all about today. So, so thanks, thanks for that, Luca. Thank you, Gunther. And so, Roy, Lucy, we'll catch up with you later at the end for the panel discussion. And uh, Gunther, uh, your thirty minutes start now. Tell us all about Orion, please. Okay, thank you, thank you, Luca. So. Um, yeah, Project Orion um, really kicked off in, as I said, in about April of last year when uh, the uh, OTTC and Shetland Island Council got together uh, with myself as the project coordinator. 
uh, and started thinking about the Greater Shetland region uh, with regard to, to energy, renewables and oil and gas, and how, how we could really transition that uh, as we move forward to a net zero world. Uh, and we were joined also by HIE, Highlands Islands Enterprise, as a strategic partner. Uh, and uh, more recently this year, Strathclyde University uh, joined the group as a strategic partner as well. Uh, and they bring obviously a lot of experience and knowledge uh, to, to Orion. So it's fantastic having them on board. Uh, whether or not we're the UK's first green energy island, I'm not sure about that, but certainly we want to go that way and we want to be a global energy hub. So I don't want to be in competition with anybody. We certainly are all about collaboration with Orion. So, but, but the agenda is truly to, to drive transformational change in the, in the whole region. Uh, Hannah, put the next slide up, please. So like any um, project, you really need, uh, need a vision. I think a couple of pictures here on the right-hand side hopefully en encapsulate that. I, th I think the first one, you need skilled workforce. And um, obviously in Shetland and, and around Shetland, you have uh, a lot of skilled workforce in oil and gas that can easily be transferred to renewables. There's already renewable energy there onshore already in the form of wind and tidal. Um, you have industrial lands, you can see in the bottom right, the Salambo area, over 1,500 acres of land. So a lot of brownfield sites that can be repurposed. Deep water ports like Salambo with 24 meter berthing. And, and very importantly, a phenomenal energy source, both onshore uh, and offshore. So you have onshore wind, a potential for offshore wind. You have tidal already uh, operational in Shetland. I'll talk more about, about both of those a bit later. So you have the, all of the key components that really drive the ambition of Orion, which is threefold. The first one is to use onshore wind initially to enable offshore electrification in the west of Shetland, primarily aimed at some of the new developments there, and then turning back with offshore wind into full electrification and net zero. Uh, the second part is really to transform the whole of the Shetland uh, current, uh, current energy usage, which is very fossil fuel based. Uh, to renewables. So that's a, that's a huge transformation in its own right. And then third, using some of that wind power, especially offshore wind power to create hydrogen, green hydrogen at scale for, for export and create, create a brand new business model in Shetland. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, oil and gas uh, was, the, was the new world in Shetland. What we want now for the next 40 or 50 years is for renewables to be the new business in Shetland. So that's the ambition of the project. Uh, next slide, please. So every project needs a bit of a strategic framework. And a lot of these slides have uh, quite, quite a lot of information and they will be shared later on. So, so one of the key things here is, to, is for the local uh, Shetland Council also to create uh, policies and strategy for the island itself. So in parallel to uh, Orion working, the council are working very hard as well to create these policies and to create their own internal strategy. So an energy policy, a hydrogen uh, strategy, for instance, um, they've hired new people in to actually take on what we call a futures energy team. Um, so there's real intent by SIC to, to create this change. Uh, and this change will then hopefully develop the new renewables industry that I mentioned. Uh, so there's a lot of moving parts with Orion and uh, this whole framework needs to be in place over the next couple of years so that we can have full implementation uh, by 2035. Next slide, please. So what about the resource potential and also the product and CO2 abatement? So the, the slides in sort of three parts. So if I can start on the left hand side. So currently there is already uh, wind power on Shetland, uh, a very small wind farms, but the, the biggest wind farm in Europe, the Viking wind farm is currently under construction, 433 megawatts with an interconnected to the mainland will become operational in 2025. There's also other wind farms in, in, in planning stages right now. And there's potential up to three quarters of a gigawatt of onshore wind power in Shetland in its own right to be produced. Coupled with that, you have tidal energy, currently only about two megawatts, but started up for the first tidal array in 2016 with Nova Innovation and also plans to expand that. So you, you already have a very substantial energy source on Shetland that can be used initially to electrify Western Shetland. Um, offshore developments also used uh, on Shetland itself uh, for electricity and also, as I will mention, hydrogen projects. So in the middle, what about hydrogen? Uh, a lot of people talk about hydrogen, you know, is it, is it going to solve er everything? No, it's not, but it is part of Orion. It's not the only part of Orion, but hydrogen is important. 
And if you look at um, hydrogen use, where you turn current fossil fuel usage in Shetland uh, to hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives, the 60,000 tons per annum are required in Shetland in its own right. And I'll show you a slide in a moment that, that spells that out. If you take four gigawatts of offshore wind power, you can create up to uh, 350,000 tons of green hydrogen on Shetland, which could be exported either by tanker, I'll talk more about uh, LOHCs and tanker export later, or potentially through some of the current gas infrastructure like surge or flags into St. Fergus. So, so there are export routes that are available from Shetland currently. And this is all about obviously going renewable is to abate CO2. Interestingly, uh, Shetland population is about 23,000 people. Uh, it has terminals, Salambo Sel terminal, a gas plant there. And in fact, is one of the highest emitters per capita per annum in the world. It's about 25 uh, tons per person. Uh, it's about the third or second highest in the world. So, so basically trying to um, abate that uh, is very important. If we can electrify the offshore, both the west and east, that's about 8 million tons per annum. So that's uh, half the UK current emissions from the offshore. And also if we do create blue hydrogen, which I again I'll come on to, um, that could be stored in offshore reservoirs like Magnus, for instance, under our pipeline that exists right now. So a lot of potential here to, to create uh, renewable products. Next slide, please. So Selim Bowa, as I've already mentioned, is one of the industrial hubs on Shetland. It's not the only one, but it is certainly the largest. And you can see on this picture, um, the outline of the, um, the oil tanks, the Selim terminal in front of you, the gas plant to your left, there's an airport to your right, there's a port you can see. Uh, and we really want to create this area as an energy hub. This is the nucleus, we believe, for creating a renewables business in Shetland. Uh, and one of the first steps to, towards this will be to look at electrifying uh, the terminal and the port facilities. Um, Enquest and SIC are already working together collaboratively to, to try and look at electrification. Um, the next stage of that is how can you repurpose this whole site into other businesses? Could it be an energy park? Can you put the green hydrogen plants here? Lots of area, over 1,500 acres just in the terminals themselves, also in uh, local council land, like the airport, which is currently um, suspended in operations. So you've got a huge area here, and you've got a phenomenal deep water port, which has been exporting oil and LNG for over 40 years. Um, so 24 meter berth in depth there. So, so you've got all of the ingredients to, to create uh, an energy hub. Next slide, please. So I mentioned um, Shetland usage in its, in its own right, and, and um, this flying brick slide tries to sort of set out um, some of that. So there's, there's two parts to the slide. The bottom part is uh, electrical power, pure, pure uh, electrons. Uh, the other part is um, turning current fossil fuels uh, into hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives like methanol or, or, or similar. So What's interesting on this, uh, you can see that um, electrification of vehicles and the port facilities are there on the bottom left hand side from onshore wind, very, very doable. Uh, and then if you want to look at converting everything else into renewables and going away from fossil fuels, you need quite a, quite a large uh, uh, quantity of power there. To do that. This is a gigawatt of power for Shetland in its own right to convert to, to fully renewables. Um, so you can see the marine side of this is, is huge, uh, one of the biggest fishing fleets in, in the UK, there's ferries there, so there's, there's a lot of ambition to create a marine strategy as well, uh, and, and to look at the renewables uh, to replace the fossil fuel base that is currently used. So there's a local market, let alone a regional opportunity. So could you go to the next slide please? So talking about regional opportunities, I uh, already mentioned the ports in Shetland, um, Sullenbo and Dalesville uh, are two, two key ports, but there are also others. Uh, a lot of uh, experience here uh, on the marine side uh, have dealt with tankers and the oil and gas service industry literally for decades uh, and potentially could export um, via tanker um, into the European backbone. Uh, there's, there's a huge demand um, for, for, hydrogen, for green hydrogen in particular uh, from Europe, especially Germany. Uh, and we've had many conversations with the help of the SDI with many German companies who are showing interest in Shetland. Um, for ports to be able to do this, uh, there does need to be investment made and investment uh, in two ways. One is um, for the ports to support the, uh, the new 
uh, offshore floating wind industry, uh, be it through um, assembly, even fabrication, certainly operations and maintenance, but also the ports then to have the ability to potentially export some of that green hydrogen through tankers. So, so the ports is quite an important part of, of the story here. Uh, and um, the Orion project, or, or certainly SIC on behalf of the Orion project, have uh, applied to the UK government for, for funding from the Ports Fund. Um, so we are, we're hoping that we will get some support from the UK and the Scottish government to help develop some of the ports in Shetland. So marine export um, is an, an, an area, and obviously for this to happen, it's all about green hydrogen, and you do need offshore wind at scale uh, to, to make this sort of export happen. So that's, uh, that's a bit of the marine story there. So could I get the next slide, please? So blue hydrogen, um, if you look at Scotland, there's only two places, as far as I know, uh, where you can uh, produce blue hydrogen. One is at St. Fergus, and we have uh, the Acorn project is, uh, is firmly based there, uh, and also on Shetland, because in fact, Shetland receives two gas import lines, one from the Totals Line and Tormore fields, and one from associated gas from, from the west of Shetland, uh, which should be coming through for another 30 or so plus years. Um, so you have the gas arriving at the beach, you have an industrial land, you have a gas plant, uh, and you also have um, southern oil and gas terminal. Um, you have pipelines that go to the offshore as well. Uh, for example, the Easter Shetland pipeline system to Magnus, where you could potentially put your CO2. And you've got export routes through surge, through blending uh, into St. Fergus, and also potentially from tanker export, which is being currently worked through an LOHC study. Um, so you have all of the components. What we don't know, uh, and it's the same for many of our current opportunities, is that is this technically feasible? Is it commercially feasible? So there needs to be front end work done here to, to see whether blue hydrogen is, is truly an opportunity for Orion. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this schematic shows a sort of combination of electrification and green hydrogen production. I've put a lot of moving parts on here, but um, let me try and uh, pick my way through it. So I've already mentioned onshore wind being an enabler for some of the developments in West Shetland, but you need far more uh, wind and it need to be offshore uh, to, to develop uh, the producing fields West Shetland and also potentially in East Shetland. And, and as Lucas said right at the beginning about repurposing some of the platforms, we already talked about repurposing pipelines, but platform repurposing could also happen in the East of Shetland Basin. Um, there you can also see Salambo as being the energy hub, exporting potentially green hydrogen, or possibly also blue hydrogen um, into, into St. Fergus, looking at tanker export. You have a series of uh, local wind farms, um, which are currently under planning on, on Yale, for instance, those, that's the, the, the three wind turbines you can see there. Uh, also a byproduct of uh, green hydrogen is auction. Uh, fish farming is a massive business. 25% of um, Scottish salmon comes from Shetland. There's a huge industry there. There's hatcheries there, they need oxygen. The Space Center uh, up on Unst, which plans I think to launch its first rocket by 2023, 2024, will also need oxygen, as, uh, which is a product of uh, electrolysis of uh, water flow from green hydrogen. So, so, you know, there's a real circular economy here. So a lot of uh, moving parts, but a real ambition to sort of drive this forward. Could I get the next slide, please? So as, as I already mentioned, uh, we've got some great opportunities, but we do need to do some upfront, upfront work. Uh, and this sort of describes four different areas that we're thinking of, infrastructure, distribution, transportation, and storage. But one of the first things we want to do is to undertake a techno-economic screening of Orion and the northeast of Scotland. Uh, and um, the OGTC team are driving this right now. Uh, we will have our bids in by close of late tomorrow from a number of companies to start undertaking this study starting in June for about three or so months. Um, and we have industry support on that through, through funding as well. So that's one of the first moves is to understand the big picture, if you like. Um, I've already mentioned that we have an LOHC study underway, um, uh, and that's happening right now uh, with ERM. So hydrogen carriers is there. We're looking with Strathclyde University to develop an onshore power system study. We're looking at uh, a marine strategy and a study as well being kicked off. We will be applying to the Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition, which is a 20 million fund. 
um, for to look at our marine strategy as well. So, so we really need to do a lot of front end work here now, right now, uh, with this project to check out the feasibility of the opportunity set that we see. And, and you know, government funding and industry funding for that it will be very important to move those projects forward. Next slide, please. So it's great to work with the OGTC um, in Orion. They bring so much to the table. Obviously, technology is uh, what they're all about. Uh, currently looking at um, hydrogen electrolysis using seawater, for instance. Already mentioned uh, the LOHC study that's ongoing. Um, that's being worked with uh, other uh, projects as well, which is Pale Blue Dot and the Port of Poverty. So we're in constant communication with other projects. So we do really want to collaborate Looking at uh, offshore floating wind technology uh, is important. Transportation of hydrogen through the European backbone, so, so hydrogen transportation will be important at scale as well. So, so OGTC bring so much to the table and it's great having them on board as part of, uh, of Orion. Uh, next slide, please. So I've mentioned collaboration. We already have the strategic partnership that I've mentioned between Shetland Island Council, OGTC, HIE and Strathclyde. We also work with a number of oil and gas and energy companies and supply chain that provide, as it says here, guidance and collaboration. But it does far more than that. They're providing, providing uh, funding. Uh, they're providing resource in kind as well with a number of the projects that I've already mentioned, uh, which is fantastic. We're also working and collaborating with many different organizations. Um, here's just a, and regulators, here's just a few that are named. Um, so even, even today, we're working with Energy Institute of Aberdeen and, and, and Highlands. There's a webinar later today with them on Orion. So we've got um, multiple uh, stakeholder engagements uh, going on and collaboration with many, many different organizations. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> Project timings, uh, quite a lot of detail on the slide. I said we'd, we'd be sharing the slide, but I try and bring out some of, some of the key moving parts here. So this is sort of conceptual timings and, and it's broken into four different bytes, um, which, which is front end studies, which is the blue bit. Uh, the green bit is uh, getting the sanction venue into construction and operation. But just want to cast your eye on the enabling projects, which are quite important. I think the Viking wind farm, uh, which initially was set up with a base plan to, to provide electricity to the island and also to export via the interconnected south into the grid. <clears throat> SSE are also thinking about offshore electrification as a part of that energy supply, uh, and there are conversations ongoing. They're also looking at you know, the need for more energy locally for potentially hydrogen production. So the onshore wind farm and other wind farms will be really critical enablers certainly pre-2025 to create change. We're also hoping through the Scott Wind Round, this uh, area to the east of Shetland, anyone uh, that will, hope will be licensed. And that, if uh, licensing happens, will also be a key enabler to really move at scale. And we hope that will be before uh, 2030, in fact. Tidal energy is quite, quite small at the moment with uh, two megawatts working with over innovation, but certainly plans are, are, are being worked to actually increase that. Uh, by more than tenfold, in fact, and, and tidal energy coupled with onshore wind uh, could be really key enablers for producing local green hydrogen, uh, but it will need offshore wind to create green hydrogen at scale. Um, I'd also like to show you a little bit around the green hydrogen slice here, element three. <clears throat> One of the things that we've been able to achieve over the past six months is working with the Scottish and UK government on the Island Steel Growth Fund and we've been provisionally assigned five million pounds to set up three green hydrogen pilots on Shetland. It's about four megawatts in total, um, but we have to make the business case for that. But certainly the money has been set aside through the heads of terms agreement. So that, that, that's also good news. That is also an enabler. So we have some enablers that are there, that if we can really work with them, they will create transformational change. And on the front end, we need to do a lot of studies around you know, power grids, power systems, green hydrogen production, blue hydrogen production, how we best utilize the wind resource onshore and offshore, how, how does tide it all fit into all of this. So a lot of, lot of work needs doing now on, on front end loading. Uh, next slide, please. So, so in summary, uh, I've mentioned uh, many of uh, the bullets here already, and hopefully you can read them. But I think one thing that's worth mentioning is about people, which is really critical here. 
Uh, if we can um, help electrify the offshore through Orion, we certainly will uh, be able to sustain literally thousands of jobs. You know, the Clarefield may well be producing beyond 2050, for instance. So that's a really important factor, the, the whole service sector that supports that. So getting the offshore to transition to net zero quickly through Orion is certainly an ambition there, and it will, it will um, sustain jobs. <clears throat> we also want to create new jobs as well as sustaining jobs offshore and onshore. Uh, and we've been working with Robert Gordon's uh, university to look at some modeling. And we certainly believe that we could create up to 500 new sustainable jobs post 2030 in the Shetland and North East Scotland region. So this is, you know, work still ongoing. Um, it's, it's at the front end, but we certainly can see that uh, new jobs will be created from the renewables industry. Uh, and really importantly, I mean, the whole point of doing all of this is to, to have, uh, you know, good quality of life for people in Shetland and the North East of Scotland, uh, and also to give them jobs, but at the end of the day, it's also to meet the global CO2 emissions targets that um, we've set in Scotland and the UK. Um, so, um, you know, it, it has um, a real, we believe, Orion could have a real impact on that. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Just one more. Thank you. Um, so just to uh, acknowledge the companies that are all involved uh, in Orion, uh, in particular OGTC, thank them very much for the opportunity to present Orion today. Uh, and especially to everybody listening, uh, thank you for your time as well. Hopefully you've got um, a good insight now into what, of what Orion is. I'm really happy with, uh, with the panelists uh, to, to answer as best we can any questions you might have. So, so thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Gunther. And uh, uh, I was uh, expecting, as I, as I said, uh, you know, about the integration of different energy sources and different technologies, but you went beyond and uh, made an integration from fish to space. Uh, which, uh, really, really great to see. So welcoming our panelists uh, now, Roy and Lucy. Uh, Roy, as I said before, from OGTC and also involved in the project, uh, and Lucy, Energy Transition Manager at Apollo. And uh, I'll ask you first, while we collect uh, questions from the audience, and just a reminder to the audience, I use the Q&A function and they will uh, mute and ask you to ask your questions, or if you want and prefer, I can read it uh, out for you. But you know, why don't you start uh, from, uh, from you, uh, Roy, and uh, what's well, so your comments or questions to Gunther presentation, anything to add or to challenge him, and I'll come to you, Lucy, next. No, th thanks, Gunther. As, as always, it's always very well delivered and, and it's a, an exciting project to be part of. Uh, the question I have for you, Gunther, is, you know, we've done a lot of work now and where do you think the greatest technology challenge is for us based on all of the, the discussions we've had to date? Gosh, there's lots of technology challenges, right, as you well know. Uh, I, I, I thought I'd think about the marine sector as well, about the marine fuels. Uh, I, I, I think that it's just one of many, right? So it's not the only one, but, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about different marine fuels and what's best for whichever vessels. Uh, interestingly, Shetland has every type of vessel you could imagine from, you know, port boats to uh, big cruisers coming in. Uh, you have a fishing fleet, you have ferries, you have, and they all might need slightly different um, sort of fuel sources. Uh, tugs are very high powered over very short periods of time, et cetera. So is it, is it electricity? Is it, is it actually hydrogen? Is it a hydrogen derivative? Um, I, I think a lot of work needs to be done in that area. I know we're already looking at that with the, with, with, um, with the high ships project, but um, th there's many other things. So I think there's many uh, t technology uh, challenges, Roy, but I think the marine one is a, is a pretty big one, but there are lots. That's great, thanks. Uh, I, I actually agree with you. I think the marine one would be the, the greatest one to solve, I think. Thanks. And has wide reach as well. Uh, that's, it's not just about Orion, but you know, it has far wider reach as well. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Lucy, any question or comment from your side? Yeah, thank you, Luke. So going to my, um, my question was really, it's clear that there's a huge opportunity here for the Shetlands and certainly with the infrastructure up there and, and Scott Wind and, and everything that's going up there, there seems to be a lot of key pieces of the jigsaw that I think could fit really quite nicely um, and bring a huge opportunity to the Northeast. I just wondered if you'd got a real handle on what the scale of the opportunity could be for export potential for Orion. 
I think particularly around hydrogen. So, so maybe Roy could add a bit into this as well. So, I mean, I, I gave an example of four gigawatts can give you 350,000 tons, you know, and, and um, uh, th there's enormous wind potential around Shetland, 10 gigawatts plus. It is floating wind. Um, at the moment, there's only one license that is being offered through Scott Wind. Um, we are talking to a number of wind developers that would really like to do a lot more and possibly a lot quicker as well. So, so I think um, I think trying to get um, offshore wind licensing to move as quickly as possible and to be administered as, as effectively as possible would be a really, really good outcome to then produce green hydrogen at serious large scale for export, not just the UK but into Europe. So, I mean, I you know I've given you some quotes of, of like tonnage, but I think that the offshore wind is the the big enabler for the export side of this. Uh, and then the second part is that then how do you transport it? And maybe Roy, you, you'd like to, I know that OGTC are working on the sort of European um, hydrogen backbone project. Maybe you could add a little bit to, to, to that comment. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's, I mean, Germany alone, uh, I believe, are going to have to import over 50% of their energy demand by 2050. And it's, you know, that that's, that's several, several terawatt hours of, of energy that they need. Um, and I think the important part about this is, is figuring out how Scotland uh, probably joins as many dots around the energy hubs to, in order to supply, you know, the Europe's of the world. Because I think Germany and other parts of Europe will be desperate for more energy than, than, than is available. And I think uh, Scotland's been a, um, addressing about 25% of that energy in the future. That's how much wind potential we have in the whole of Scotland. So everyone's eyes on us and this is a great opportunity to, to really drive that hydrogen economy and actually start an export market. Very good. So now it's time to open the floor for questions from the audience. And I see there was a question from uh, Mark and uh, Mark, you said that that question was partially answered, but you had a, a follow up on that. So Mark Anderson, which I take the opportunity to introduce is our new TechX director at OGTC. Mark, are you on mute, off mute? And can you ask your question, please? Thanks, uh, Luca. Yeah, I hope I'm off mute. Um, uh, so, uh, Gunter, thanks very much for a really interesting uh, presentation. So my, my question was, was around um, low carbon transport, um, and, and you, you alluded it to, to it before. Um, but um, are there any plans perhaps to look at um, generating um, <coughs> uh, clean fuels in Shetland, perhaps for use on the export tankers? So using the offshore wind um, to, to, to make synthetic fuels for, for uh, maritime transport. Mark, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I'll, I'll answer best I can, and maybe Roy or Lucy can, can add as well. I, I think uh, I've already mentioned that a marine strategy is one of the key strands of, of Orion, and we're just starting to work that with, uh, with Strathclyde University uh, marine team. Also, Arup and Ricardo uh, are helping as well to try and develop our thinking. Uh, it's at a very early stage, but we certainly see that there's an opportunity, uh, a business opportunity, not just for Shetland, but uh, for wider to set up a, a bunkering opportunity for clean fuel in Shetland. Uh, using the port facilities and the industrial land to create the product that, is, that are nearby. So I think it's certainly on our agenda, Mark. I mean, it's at a very front end of thinking. We see it as an opportunity. Uh, as, you know, answering Roy's question as best I could about what's the, what's the key technology, I think, the, I think the marine area has enormous opportunities uh, and challenges uh, that need to be addressed. So definitely on our agenda, uh, there's not a firm plan at the moment, but it will be a part of the marine strategy uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and our application for the Clean Maritime Demonstration Fund will be around a decision support sort of tool that we can use to assess different opportunities and synthetic marine fuels and bunkering will be one of those. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Roy, because uh, I know you're very heavily involved in the, in the marine side as well. Yeah, I think the, the marine side is I, I can't see us being in a position to tanker fresh green hydrogen to Europe using a diesel powered vessel. I, I do think there needs to be a, 
a step change in that space. I think it, 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 it's just not the right thing to do. Um, so I, I do think at that point, export will be via uh, alternative fuel rather than diesel. Okay, and uh, let's move on with questions that are coming in. So Vine, can I ask you to ask your question, please? Uh, I see you're maybe challenging uh, the widespread of technology focus uh, uh, in your questions, but can you say that? Yeah. Thanks, Luca. And uh, Gunter, many thanks. It was a great presentation. Um, so uh, my question was, uh, as uh, Luca alluded, is about trying to cover a uh, greater uh, you know, scope of technologies and whether is that uh, a strategic objective? Because if you focus on certain technologies or certain technological pathways, you can achieve uh, your objectives much sooner and ensure uh, a better return for your buck and you know, come out as uh, being competitive in certain technologies. So is this a spread, a mix of, uh, you know, are you trying to cover a lot of ground or do you think uh, you, know, you should focus on certain uh, technologies uh, that uh, you know, bring in uh, decarbonization uh, to this uh, Shetland area sooner? So your thoughts, please. Thanks, Sanskriti. Maybe, maybe it might be worth starting with Roy here, if you don't mind, Roy, um, and uh, because you know, you're with your GTC and looking at technology specifically. So maybe a good place to start is with you, if that's okay. Yeah, Vinny, thanks for the question. And I, I think you're right. And at the moment, we have a view of what we believe Orion could be. And over the next few months, we'll start to hone in where the biggest bang for the buck starts to come from. And I think, um, you know, if you look at what the island has to offer, it's got great onshore infrastructure um, that can be repurposed. It's got a fantastic renewable resource, both in wind and tidal, as, as mentioned, both on and offshore uh, wind. So I think, you know, we will know a bit more, but I, I agree that the, it's a very broad spe spectrum just now. And hopefully in the next three, four months, we'll be starting to hone that into an area that we think will actually create the best for, for the island. Um, but, the, you know, the big thing is about ensuring that Shetland retains the skills uh, on the island and actually gets the best out of, of the people there. Um, so there is an element of, of technology followed by what's right for the island that needs to be factored into all of the, all the technology conversations. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I think it'd be also great to have some of that technology being developed in the northeast of Scotland and also potentially on Shetland. You know, um, having test centres, we've had a number of conversations with a number of companies about can we operate some test centres in Shetland or the northeast of Scotland or both? Um, so there are multiple technologies here and uh, they're, they're all important. Uh, this is a very integrated uh, project, has very many moving parts and they're all critically important. Going right back to that ambition, electrification, there's, there's lots of technologies already developed, but how do you work with FPSOs for electrification, for instance, offshore substations at scale? You know, and then you look at, um, you look at how do you transform the whole of a, an island economy um, that has been really bedded down in fossil fuels for literally decades into something totally new. And I think in fairness, you know, Nova Innovation with, with Tidal, they've just created the very first um, EV point charging from Tidal in the world. So, so there's a development and they're working with Tesla on, on Shetland. So, you know, what, what do you do on Shetland? And then if you look at the big green hydrogen picture, you know, as Roy said, how do you export the commodity, and and how and what how do you fuel the vessels that actually export the commodity? If it's by ship, if you want to do it by by pipeline, how does that all work? You know, well, when it gets to the the end point, how do you blend all of that? So so there's a whole series of technologies that are interlinked. So I can't I can't say there's any one that is stands out head and shoulders above above the rest. They're all really incredibly important. Thank you. And uh, I think on the topic of export, we also have a question from uh, Harry Morris. Uh, Harry, can you make your question live? Hi, um, Gunter. Great talk. Um, good to see what sort of the island's up to. Equally from the Isle of Wight myself, uh, you know, always interested in islands building sort of their, their, their economy. Are elements of a project dependent on building uh, an export market or is it enough all these technologies and this concept to build um, around self-sufficiency, because obviously you're, you're a long way from the market, which adds significant additional costs. So uh, 
Let me try and answer that best I can, Henrik. So I, I think Shetland in its own right really needs to develop its own renewables energy for itself. Um, mm -hmm. Shetland has for decades been a transportation hub for oil and gas, which heads elsewhere in the world, be it to the beaches on around the Aberdeen through St. Fergus, or be it to Rotterdam if it's in an oil tanker. And, and, and the local community have had to pay um, a lot more premium because they've had to import all of their petrol, diesel, um, marine fuels, etc., uh, and pay a premium on it. And also have some of the highest network charges for electricity in the UK. Uh, and don't forget, Shetland, I don't know if you know it, I know it quite well, um, is uh, unfortunately it can be quite windy, which is good. Uh, not if you were to stand out today, it can be quite cold and wet and dark. And uh, a Shetland household uses twice as much energy as a household in the, in the Isle of Wight, for instance, uh, because, of, because of those factors. So they need to produce their own renewable energy. It'd be absolutely, in my view, criminal uh, to end up importing green energy into Shetland when you have this phenomenal resource on your doorstep. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think then you also need to create a, a new industry. You've got um, you know, a, a lot of uh, young people and you've got a lot of currently skilled people who, who want to continue employment and live in Shetland. They like living there, even though it can be a bit cold and damp, it still is a fantastic place to live. So, so you've got to replace the oil and gas sector with something. So you, you've got to move to, to a new world of renewables. And to do that, not just to the island, but do it at a scale uh, whereby you're you are obviously providing that energy to other parts of the world, not just the UK. And I think the third point, you know, you're talking about the Isle of Wight. I mean, we're involved in a number of projects looking at how islands can work together. Um, so there's a project currently called Robinson. We're also involved with uh, the huge project. We're involved with a number of European islands that are looking at how can island communities actually work together uh, to, to develop their own renewables resource, not just for themselves, but also potentially for, for business opportunity for export. So, 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 I, I, so that's, that's my answer as best I can is, you know, to me, there's a number of really big pieces here that, that uh, need to happen, uh, not just for, for the island, but, but for the wider economies as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. So I'll go to Fraser Graham next, uh, but uh, tell me, there's also a hand raised in the, in the in the participants. I see Gita Nyanjali, if I say that right, uh, hopefully. Uh, so Gita Nyanjali, just let me know if you're uh, up for questions and if you can put your question in the Q&A. But you know, let's go to Fraser next. Uh, Fraser, you want to talk about supply chain in Shetland, don't you? Fraser, you're unmuted. Can you ask your question? Okay, Fraser, we can't hear you. So maybe I'll read out uh, the question that you put into the Q&A section. So Fraser would like to know how the Orion project uh, will look at supply chain readiness uh, and if there is anything the supply chain can do to prepare and to get a fair shot. Who wants to take that one? Well, I'll, I'll start and then um, hand over to the panelists as well. Um, so I think there's a num number of different levels here with the supply chain. So the first one, with regard to Orion, Orion as a project, um, we have continuous engagement with the supply chain about Orion and Orion opportunities. Uh, and I've already mentioned the techno-economic screening study um, that, that is going to be undertaken very soon. Uh, and we've engaged with dozens and dozens of companies about that, that, that study in particular, but it's far more than that. We're talking to supply chain about here are the opportunities. Would you like to get involved in Orion? I, would, I was talking about test centers. Would you like to set up test centers? What, what, what can you do? What can Orion do for you? So we do a lot of conversation with, with the supply chain. And also locally, we've held webinars with the local supply chain. We intend to um, engage literally dozens of companies very soon on Shetland itself in the marine strategy. So we have a communication and engagement strategy with Orion, which is very, very strongly focused on the supply chain. It's focused with many stakeholders, uh, but supply chain is, is, is one of those, which is one of the key areas for us. So, so Roy, do you want to talk about that? Because you, you've also done a, quite, quite a lot of work with the supply chain, maybe, maybe Lucy as well, because she's, on, she's seen it from the other side, if you like, of looking in on Orion. Lucy, do you want to come in first and then I'll follow up behind you? 
I can do, that's very kind. Um, I, the, the one thing that I did want to say was to sort of echo that really, Gunter, and just to say that kind of the timing of Orion feels like it's almost been made for the, uh, for the supply chain. So with some of the early um, integration projects that are going on in, 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 in Aberdeen and across the UK, um, perhaps the supply chain feels like they happened a little bit early um, and that they missed out on them because they seem to just happen um, and out of nowhere a project was born and, and unless you were involved in the very early studies then perhaps you can't quite get a, a foot into the door and and over the last 12 months a lot of the supply chain has really been trying to work out I think exactly where it fits into the energy transition but you know we're, we're just into quarter two of 2021 and and Orion's really at the beginning of, of the journey and I think that because of the scale and, and the nature of the opportunity and there's already been a lot of engagement from Orion with the supply chain and, and it, it definitely feels like the message from Orion and, and from the OGTC is we've got all of these amazing pieces of infrastructure and an opportunity but actually we, we think that the answer lies within the supply chain so the thrust has been very much about you know the supply chain you bring the answers to us you bring the technologies to us and I think that that will really sort of push the supply chain to to be able to have time to understand exactly where it fits into Orion and be able to prepare and, and strategize in order to be able to meet the demand. And then if Orion moves at the pace, which it says it will, and, and I'm sure it will with you at the home, to be honest with you, Gunther, um, in order to meet the, you know, the net zero ambitions of Scotland, then I think that this project could really help the supply chain um, of the whole of the northeast of Scotland get on the front foot. Um, on the front front globally, actually, not not just on behalf of the UK. Very good, thank you, Lucy. Uh, Neil Wilkinson, uh, you're up next, and then I'll come to you, Glenn, if you can prepare. Neil, what's your question? Hey, so you can hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, yeah. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, my um, query was just around, we talked a lot about the demand uh, of, and the growth of countries like Germany and, and, and their demand for hydrogen moving forward. Um, obviously, there's a clear opportunity for us as a country to supply that, although I would imagine other countries are trying to do the same. Um, obviously, with the high costs of green uh, green hydrogen at the moment, um, is there a lot of, do we foresee a lot of support from the government stepping in to help develop these projects at scale, especially if, you know, with the high tie-in fees for, you know, transmission of offshore wind in Scotland uh, further up, further north? So, I mean, if there's... I've seen some announcements from the government, but do we expect to see more basically to help drive this forward? So, so maybe I'll start if that's okay, uh, the panelists. So, so I think we've, we, we have fantastic listening at the moment uh, with the Scottish and UK government. And I think some of that is now turning into you know, direct support. I've, I've already mentioned I obviously your growth fund. Uh, this week, we in fact had a, a meeting with uh, Andrew Higgins, who is uh, Boris Johnson's net zero czar. Uh, about the Orion project, and and he was, you know, he was really very very positive about it. So we're getting a lot of very positive political engagement and political support. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, SDI; um, they've connected us to so many different companies in Europe. It's been phenomenally helpful. So I think we're on on the start of our journey. Uh, I also think, and Roy can talk a bit more of the Energy Transition Fund. We've also made an application to that. Um, so it does need government support initially. I mean, I mean, you know, yeah, we, we need to produce green hydrogen at scale. And, and, and to do that, we need to start with some support to make it uh, uh, commercially viable to do so. Uh, and certainly, as I mentioned, with the green hydrogen projects with the Islands uh, Deal Fund, I mean, that is five million of government funding, which is then matched by local industry um, to actually set up these green hydrogen plants. So that's a great example of, you know, really putting your, your money where your mouth is. So, so great engagement uh, right now, uh, and it's picking up. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to even more support from from government and industry as well. So let's not forget uh, many of the companies I, I I talked to the slide with regard to uh, supporting uh, Orion and putting you know cash uh, into into a number of the study areas that we have here, uh, which includes the council and the OGTC through their funding mechanisms. So. So I think we are definitely moving forward on this. Um, Roy, any thoughts from you? Yeah, thanks, Gunther. I mean, that's a good summary. I mean, I think, Neil, to, you know, there's so many funds out there. You could spend a, 
you could spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week at the moment trying to establish which funds can actually support these types of projects. But, you know, Gunther's right. We, we do need government support to really kick these off. The sort of seed support definitely is needed to, to really get the, the ball moving. You know, you can look at uh, St Fergus and the Acorn project. You know, there's so much uh, effort going into getting the right funding and getting the right mechanisms and actually getting the right ears to listen. And, you know, Gunther's doing a great job in terms of, of getting Orion actually up there as an, an opportunity that, that the governments can spend time on. But, uh, you know, there are so many funds out there. You could be, have a full-time job for sure. Uh, if, looking at if I can add just a quick comment, uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of uh, interest and a lot of uh, uh, progress uh, towards hydrogen uh, by government policy. There's a hydrogen strategy due to come out uh, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and we're going to see much, much more of hydrogen from industry and from, uh, uh, from governments. Uh, and that is all across, uh, across the North Sea and, uh, and beyond. Now, uh, we're getting to the last 10 minutes. Uh, there are a few questions. I can ask our panelists and Gunther to try to be quick in answering so that we can cover uh, most of them as we can. The next one is uh, from Glenn McLennan. Uh, Glenn, uh, you're up next. Uh, you're unmuted. Uh, go on. Yeah, thanks. Look, at, uh, Gunther, I was just a question for you. Could you elaborate a, a little bit on the type of test centres that you're, you're thinking about that would be of most value for you know, pushing this industry forward? Uh, are you talking about the you know, hydrogen production technologies? Are you speaking about uh, transportation technologies or component technologies? You know, what, what is it you're thinking about? And the reason I'll give you an idea why I'm asking, we have a test facility here in Orkney on the Flotta Terminal um, for process uh, top size technologies and we're very keen on looking at diversification uh, on the site here. Thanks Glenn and, and just to say we're, we're also really keen to collaborate um, with other projects like like in Orkney, like the Port of Cromarty, like Pale Blue Dot and we, we, we do believe collaboration is the way forward so it's good to share and work with each other because I think it's a, a, it's a, it's a joint problem or a joint opportunity rather um, so I think uh, one of them comes to mind quite, quite soon is, is around uh, synthetic marine fuels. Um, you know, it'd be great to set something up, um, I think, in, in Solomon Um Solomon could do also so much with uh, possibly uh, tidal and, and uh, also green hydrogen combinations. Uh, I know that there's certain parts of the world that has some of that technology right now. There's a combi of a, of a wind turbine and a, a tidal turbine. I'd love to see one of those in Shetland because they've got phenomenal wind and phenomenal tides. Um, I'd love to see that being a, a test centre as well. Um, so those are my thoughts. Um, Roy or, or Lucy, any thoughts from yourself? Um, I think the opportunity for test centres will all, always be derived, I think, from what we think the technology we're trying to to implement in the in the area that's going to create the best value. I mean, at the moment I don't have a view, but I do think the marine side is is very interesting because it's still a big emitter that we haven't really got our arms around. So I kind of support Ginter's thoughts on that. All right, there's a question from Ernie next. Uh, is uh, also about Orkney. So Ernie, have we answered that question already, or are there's anything specifically that you want to ask? Yeah, yeah, I think Glenn's question covered it for me. I, I was asking, are you exploring the synergies with uh, what Orkney's doing? Because uh, a, a lot of the things you're talking about sound very similar to what or Orkney's been doing over the years, particularly in the hydrogen space. Uh, given that the question's been answered, uh, another one that came to mind was, you've not said anything about wave power uh, and uh, with the intermittency issues of, uh, of all renewables, but wind in particular, are you looking at wave power as another thing to kind of fill the gap? So, so Ernie, th th thanks for the question, and 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 um, and also thanks to Orkney have been groundbreaking in what they've been doing over many many years. So, so well done to to, to Orkney, and we are in good connection with with Orkney, and, and want to collaborate. Uh, I, I think um, I think what's what, what's what's important here is that we we do actually work together as much as we can. Ernie, I think that, that that's really important and we do learn from each other so that we can actually share as we move forward through these opportunities and potentially test some of the opportunities together. I think the, the screening study uh, that uh, we're undertaking, a uh, techno-economic screening study for the northeast of Scotland and Orion will also be important in doing that. 
So I think as, as we move forward, the more and more we can collaborate, uh, the better. I think that would be a great thing. Uh, and if, if you're talking about wave power, uh, there is a lot of potential around Shetland for that. We are uh, in communication with Nova that are looking obviously at Tidal, but they're also looking at wave. Uh, it, it's not a big play inside Orion right now, uh, but I think uh, more and more we'll be thinking about wave energy as well as tidal energy as being components of the future renewable strategy for Shetland in particular, because I think at the scale we're looking at, it will be potentially more Shetland orientated or island orientated than uh, an exportable uh, energy source. But there's, there's plenty of wave potential uh, around Shetland, as I'm sure you're well aware. Okay, we have two more questions. If I can go to them, um, we need to try to answer them quickly, which might be a challenge for the to question. Rosalind from Madagascar, that's a testimony of the global reach of our uh, webinars. Uh, floor is yours. Uh, we have to ask you a question, please. You seem not to be unmuted. Uh, can you unmute? Right, okay, maybe I'll ask the question on behalf unmute. of. Unmute. Very good. You are online. Unmute. <laughs> Unmute. No, no, we can hear you. Yeah. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I asked a question in the chat, but uh, Madagascar has some huge uh, uh, potential in the fossil fuel, but also uh, has huge potential in renewable energy. And uh, we would like, uh, actually, the question is posed in the chat, how can we uh, um, actually uh, co-mingle and uh, uh, extract the huge uh, potential uh, out of this? Yeah. Well, challenging question. Yeah, last yeah. Minute, uh. Well, Rosalind, great question. And I think how Orion is, has tried to achieve it. And we are very interested in learning from all projects of how you achieve things. I think the way we've achieved it is to create uh, a group of companies that we call a steering group. Uh, and they, they, it exists with um, oil and gas companies and energy companies that are not oil and gas based. In fact, working together and seeing what the opportunity set is by collaborating and working together. So I think if you can set up dialogue between your oil and gas uh, operators and your en renewable energy companies and obviously have someone to to help coordinate that be it through uh, Madagascar government or councils or whatever I think that is a that is a possible way of how you can get that dialogue to start um, Roy you've been on this journey as well anything you you want to add there no I was going to pass it over to Lucy and uh, yeah. Lucy can, I, can I add one more to that can I add one more to that very quickly is it though. <laughs> Yeah, I'm an environmental advocate, I, I, and I uh, actually lived in U.S. for more than 30 years. Okay. And uh, Madagascar has a uh, Madagascar is one of the poorest country, and needs quite a bit of uh, resource to uh, lift uh, the economy and uh, 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 get out of the 25 million people out of poverty. There is a famous, famous song in Madagascar that uh, says that uh, the environmental, the climate change, all of this is uh, in a euphemist way, uh, say that it's for the rich country, uh, for the poor country, we want to actually do, deal with what is to bring the food to our table. Yeah. Madagascar has trillions trillion of reserve so uh, let me try let me try and answer i know we're going to run out of time rosaline so my apologies for cutting across you now there are a number of island initiatives being developed one is called robinson um afterwards we can perhaps provide you with some information of how madagascar as an island a very big island come to that uh, can actually link into this of how they can work together to to uh, because some of those islands are actually do suffer not just from fuel poverty but from poverty so, so let, let me perhaps follow up afterwards and, and try and guide you towards uh, an organization that could potentially help you. Ro Rosalind, thank you. Yeah, please be in touch. We're also planning our presence and activity at COP26, which is you know, exactly where all these conversations about how to uh, 
combine uh, the need to stop emissions uh, and uh, reduce uh, you know, the global warming with the need to bring out of poverty and energy poverty, especially in nations uh, in, the, in the southern or uh, equatorial area, which is also the more uh, threatened by the climate change. So it's definitely a topic which is very, very important. We don't have really the time uh, to go through now, but you know, get in touch and we'll be keen to explore and, uh, and engage more on that. Um, there's an answer there about uh, uh, oxygen in aquaculture. We might take that uh, offline or answer directly uh, because we have uh, reached uh, the end of our time. I would like just to thank you again, uh, Gunther, for, for a great presentation and thank all of the uh, 90 plus uh, participants that we had uh, at PIC. And of course, a big thank you to Roy and Lucy for uh, being part of the panel. And close just a reminder that we have a series of events, you know, so follow our website. And our next one is actually tonight as an evening with six inspiring leaders. So it's six industry leading female leaders that will share their journey, the high and the low and everything in between. So I think the link is in the chat now. If you want to join, there's already a big audience, but the duty of doing virtually is you have no limit. So you're welcome to join again. That will be tonight, uh, including our own uh, CEO, Colette Cohen, and, uh, and five others uh, uh, outstanding uh, female leaders in the industry. And with that, you know, uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, the team, for uh, making everything work smoothly. And I look forward to see you at the next Inside 60. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you, everybody.